So uh, can I get a quick show of hands who here is familiar with uh, Finagle? OK, pretty good. How many of you guys have written your own protocol or used a protocol other than Thrift, HTTP, uh, maybe Redis, and MySQL? OK, a few. Of course, Travis has. So I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to break my, my talk up into three main sections. So we'll start with some kind of concepts of what are protocols in Finagle and why might you write your own and what is writing your own entail. Second part, we'll go into kind of a case study of what we've done at Tendril with Finagle Protobuf. Uh, and at the end, I'll share some of the lessons uh, and recommendations that we have out of that. So at Tendril, we do uh, energy efficiency uh, and energy intelligence. We're all about trying to understand how people use energy in their homes and optimize for that. And we've done that by building our stack on top of Finagle uh, using Finagle Protobuf. Uh, and uh, we've run that in production for three and a bit years now. So let's start with concepts. Uh, most of you guys raised your hand. You are familiar with Finagle. So this should be mostly review. Finagle is an extensible RPC system. And it's protocol agnostic. And I highlight these couple things because these are kind of to me, a couple of the key things, uh, A, that are relevant to my talk, but B, that are differentiators for Finagle. So extensible RPC uh, means we can add to it, means we can use that to make RPC light calls as opposed to something like uh, RESTy kind of calls. Uh, and protocol agnostic, again, meaning we can build on top of it and it doesn't know anything about HTTP and all that kind of stuff. So, so why RPC, and in particular, why a binary format like protobuf? So RPC, uh, sorry, so REST, right, is resource oriented, very oriented around the data. We have a very fixed set of verbs that we use to operate on that data. RPC, on the other hand, is operation oriented. We're going to have the flexibility to have many more different verbs and operations that we're going to use. So a lot of times when you're writing REST, it feels kind of weird to say, you know, perform the simulation or something. Is that a get? Is that a post? Is that a put? I don't know. I'm going to have to argue about it with my colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. So um, some things just are naturally procedurally, not uh, resourcey. In terms of binary formats uh, versus JSON, binary, if we have a really chatty system, we're passing a lot of data, we can do that more efficiently in a binary format. A lot of the serialization and deserialization tools are faster uh, than uh, doing JSON, uh, JSON parsing on strings. And a lot of these uh, particular binary formats, protocol, buffers, Avro, Thrift, et cetera, have a lot of other rich semantics that you can do to build your messages. Um, and those are usually defined in terms of an interface definition language, which gives us some kind of schema that we can work with to define our messages. So protocols in Finagle, turns out we talk about fin uh, protocols all over the place in the Finagle docs, but there's never really a definition. So for purposes of this talk, a protocol in Finagle uh, has a codec uh, for uh, doing the, the encoding and decoding for the wire, dispatchers to figure out what methods you're going to call on each end, uh, client and server configuration, initialization, and setup -y kind of stuff error handling, uh, and then potentially integrations with uh, code generators, compilers, other things that are defining your protocol. So let's start at the top of that list. So codecs uh, in Finagle, based on the codec trait, they define the encoding and decoding that we're going to use on the wire. And this builds on top of Netty. Um, in order to format up your stuff, send it over the Netty channel pipeline to the other side unformatted on the other side. Codecs also let you modify the service filter stack, so you can add things like uh, filtering, um, logging, tracing, all those kinds of things as filters. Typically, you would have uh, your protocol be symmetric, so uh, the same kind of formats, same kinds of objects on both the client side and the server side. And your request and your response uh, are probably also going to use the same encoding both ways, but there might be some reason why you want to have things look differently to clients than they look to services or have your request format format things in an entirely different way than your response formats things. So, uh, and codec factory is another trait that's, uh, that's there 
to relate your client and server codecs. So technically, you end up having a client codec for the request and the service codec, uh, sorry, the other way around, uh, client, a client codec for the client writing to the service side and the service codec for reading the other thing. So the end flow looks something like this, right? Your client code uh, is going to call to your uh, client side service dispatch, your client side dispatcher, then encode the data for the wire, send it over the finagle netty channel pipeline. On the other side, decode that back into some objects, figure out what you're going to call in your service dispatcher, call your service implementation. Coming back the other way, reverse all the arrows, uh, re encode it back up to send back to the client. Client unpacks it, matches it back up with requests, sends it back to your client code. And your service dispatcher and client dispatcher here deal with any errors that happen to arise. So when you're building your interface uh, for your protocol, what sort of interface do you want to expose? Uh, and there's kind of a spectrum here where one side is you're exposing finagle things, uh, services from request to response. The other side is you're trying to fit some kind of protocol, right? You're trying to fit code that's generated by Proto-C or by a thrift compiler or something like that. Uh, and you could do something in the middle. So in uh, uh, Twitter's case, uh, Thrift uses a special compiler Scrooge that generates shapes that are much more uh, finagle-like shapes. In the case of our finagle protobuf, we're using Proto-C's compiler. It's generating uh, interfaces, and we're trying to fit that. So connection handling, there's a couple ways that you can do connection handling. One is multiplexing, and the other is connection pooling. Uh, connection pooling, you end up creating new connections to make more requests. You typically only have one open request per connection, uh, and you only reuse a connection once you've uh, completed a request. Uh, if things fail, maybe your connection closes. Um, maybe you close a connection every time, but you're still using more connections for more requests. Whereas a connection multiplexing approach, uh, which Finagle implements in MUX, uh, uses one connection and shares that connection for many simultaneous requests. And then you have the complexity of dealing with uh, matching up a response to which requests do I need to go call callbacks on. Uh, connection pooling ends up having a lot more configurations. Uh, MUX has a simpler configuration model. Uh, but so you have to decide what you're going to build on top of. Another concept within Finagle is a uh, service stack. Uh, so Finagle builds up a stack of components that each handle a small bit of behavior. Uh, and by stacking these things all together, then we get a rich uh, service that can do all of the retries and timeouts and loggings and different things, uh, different points in the stack. Uh, there's a stack API uh, that you can use now to build that. Twitter docs say, this is subtle and should be used by experts. Uh, or there's client builder and server builder, which Twitter docs say these will be uh, deprecated, so maybe don't build on them. So hopefully by the time we get to the point that t Twitter makes a decision to deprecate, there'll be a little more uh, uh, docs and a better way to do the stack API so that it's not so subtle and expert. So I want to talk a little bit about ways to handle errors. So um, I'm thinking about errors two ways, right? So we have application errors, which are things that arise out of your software, right? Out of your services. You're um, trying to run a simulation, uh, do some physics, and you don't have weather data. Uh, you're trying to um, get stuff from the database, and you don't have a connection to the database. Something like that, something that's application level. Might be an exception, might be um, you know, some kind of empty response, something like that. Versus framework errors, where you have timeouts, where you have rejections because there's too much work going on, uh, where you have an exception escape from somewhere that you catch and you have to deal with. So you have the question about do you deal with these two different types of errors the same way or different ways? And there's kind of three main ways that you can approach those. One way is protocol. So if your protocol supports some kind of error mechanism, that's a really great thing to use. So Thrift supports a specific message type, which is an exception. So if you can model your things into uh, Thrift's exception, that's really nice. 
you don't have that available, now you have to decide, am I using special formatting on the wire to transmit my message? Or am I transmitting this, um, this error at user level, right? So um, in the user level case, you have a, a certain message type or you have a, a field within your message that you're going to reserve uh, for populating the error. And then you're going to have to decide, how do I connect, uh, catch exceptions and map them to one of these approaches? How do I do it on the other side? Um, am I throwing exceptions in places and catching exceptions? Am I just storing exceptions and never throwing them? All those kinds of things. And do you want to do it the same way on the client and on the server? So now let's talk about Finagle Protobuf more specifically. So I'll start with going into a little bit what uh, Protobuf IDL is like. Right, and this is based on the Protobuf2 IDL. So uh, we have a couple of different kinds. We have messages and we have services. So messages uh, end up being like the, the data transfer objects or the value objects that we're going to pass around. So here I've got a message. He's got an optional string. He's got an optional int. He's got an optional context. So we see here that we can have different types. Uh, we can have they might be the uh, optionality. They might be there. They might not be there. Uh, we can refer to other messages. This context is referring to an, uh, another message. My example here doesn't show repeated, doesn't show required. Uh, required in Proto 3 is going away anyway. Um, and when we use the standard Proto C compiler, uh, we get some Java classes that, that we can call from Scala that, uh, that look something like this, right? They generate a builder pattern that we can use to build up. Uh, our messages, uh, and they provide some um, checks for us to see, are these optional things there, uh, how many things are in one of these repeated lists, all that kind of thing, so we can interact with these. Services define calls that we're going to make, uh, RPC methods that we're going to be able to call. Uh, so here I've got an echo service, he defines an RPC, echo, takes an echo request, returns an echo response. Uh, and we're defining these echo requests and uh, these uh, parameters and returns uh, as messages. So we'll have a message somewhere else that's defined that says what these things are. And that out of Proto C is going to generate us this monster class that has a bunch of stuff in it. Uh, one of the key things here that I want to highlight is it has an interface in there that uh, provides each method that's in that service. Um, and it has this weird shape where it takes, it, it returns void, it takes a controller, takes the request, and it takes a callback of response. So typical Java kind of shape, not really a great Scala shape. So this leads us to you know, those questions that we asked before. Do we expose this? Do we expose Finagle? Like where do we want to, um, to do our mappings? And additionally, we get some stubs, and we get some uh, reflective classes, and we get some other implementation stuff. So we at Tendril have uh, taken the pattern of using um, separate request and response envelopes, uh, and then having the data in, uh, in a message that's inside that response envelope. So I showed you Echo before. Here's our Echo request. It's got our parameters. Uh, this is a really simple one. Um, and then our response, you notice we've got this error wrapper, so that gives you an indication where we're going with our error handling. And, uh, and then our echo, which is going to be the, the response that we got back from the server that we're going to pass around and do something with, right? The, the application level response. So, so what do I want to say here? So this is... Um, this is an example of how we're going to use Proto, uh, Proto C's generated classes to call a service. And then on the next slide, I'll kind of break into where we plug into this with Finagle Protobuf. So this build echo client um, takes some, some parameters that we're going to pass to client builder. Uh, you notice here we're talking client builder, not stack API. Uh, some filters and things that we're going to build on top of the request the, the, around the service. Uh, executor service, tracer, stuff like that that we're going to pass in the client builder. So we're going to use client builder to set up our client. We're going to get the stub from the Proto C generated interfaces. Uh, 
And then we've got an RPC factory that we're gonna use to call on that stub to get the service that, it's an instance of the stub that's got the finagle service inside it. And then from a client perspective, so, so the first thing is this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, helper function that we're gonna use to set up, right? And then our individual calling code is gonna be uh, like on the bottom. Uh, we'll build the echo service with the server port that you want. In practice, we're doing a bunch of stuff to figure out that server port and whether we're getting it from Zookeeper lookup or local for test purposes and so on and so on. Uh, we'll use a RPC factory to create the controller. Uh, we're, we'll build our request. Uh, we'll set up our callback uh, and then we'll call on the stub, that echo method with the control of the request and the callback. And in practice for us, our, um, the controller that we build in the callback actually end up being the same class and actually end up also implementing uh, uh, Guava listenable features. So then we can chain these all together as Guava stuff later. So back to what we just um, walked through. So the RPC factory is how we build a stub. The stub is generated by Proto-C, implements that RPC service interface that I showed you guys before, and it delegates the method calls to a channel. Channel that we use is the RPC channel impl, uh, which uses the client builder to build the finagle service, uh, the call method that comes from the, uh, from the stub delegates to this channel impl, which delegates to the finagle service. And then when the finagle service's future completes, we resolve all our callbacks, tie everything back together uh, so that our RPC callback that we passed to the stub gets resolved. And down underneath that all, we go through our encoders uh, to format stuff up for the wire. I'll talk about that a little bit in a couple of slides, but uh, we're taking the method name that we wanna call, we're using its hash code and that's what we're passing as the code uh, that the server is gonna be able to use to figure out which method should it call on the implementation. So on the service side, services are a little bit more straightforward. We still have a bunch of parameter -y kind of stuff. We use a service builder interface uh, to create our server. And what our client, uh, what, our, what our service implementing developers end up doing is pretty much writing this little bit at the bottom uh, that extends the interface that we got from Proto-C to do whatever business logic we want to call, uh, run on the response. Uh, and, and we've provided this kind of build echo server stuff up in a, up in a wrapper library. So RPC factory built the service, service implementation that our developers write, uh, implements the Proto-C generated interface, service dispatcher when it gets the incoming request, decides which method to call and implements that, uh, sorry, invokes that method uh, when that method, the call, it provides its own callback to that method so that when that callback happens, uh, the service dispatcher then gets a uh, uh, future completed uh, and can resolve the promise accordingly. Prom future into that promise is given to Finagle uh, so that Finagle then gets that resolved, sends it back over the wire, yada, yada. Uh, so we talked about these two RPC control and RPC callbacks that happen in there. Uh, those come from Proto-C. Uh, sorry, those come from Protobuf. Those are Protobuf uh, interfaces that we've implemented. Uh, RPC control basically does the failure and cancellation stuff, and RPC callback does the run method stuff. Um, and as I said before, in practice, we have one implementation that does both of those interfaces. So I want to talk about wire formats, um, and the main place I want to go here is to talk about the way that we evolved over time and what that means when you're writing a protocol. So we started off with a really simple wire format. Uh, we had the message code, we had the message length, so that's the number of bytes that the message is going to take up, and then we had the message, and that was it. 
Later on, we said, okay, well, Finagle has this cool Zipkin thing that lets us trace through calls. What would we need to do to support Zipkin? So Zipkin has um, several spans. You have a span for the root of the trace, you have a span for yourself, and you have a span for your parent. Uh, and you have some flags that say, amongst other things, am I tracing this request, am I not tracing this request? So how do I want to pass those? Just like I said with error handling, we have to decide, are we doing that on the wire? Are we doing that in, in user space and requiring a certain shape of message uh, to hold those? We decided to do that in the wire. Well, so now we have to distinguish when we get a frame from Netty, is it the old format? Is it the new format? And one more constraint is we'd sort of like to be able to rev our services without forcing our clients to rev until they're ready. So we don't have to do that across the board for every single service just to turn this thing on. So, um, so what we came up with is we have a uh, version uh, marker. Uh, each of these is a, a few bytes uh, that we use to decide, is this one of, our, um, one of our trace messages, our V1 style? Or is this look more like the V0 style and we'll fall back and we'll use that? If it's the V1 style, then we'll go and we'll pull off all of those other traces, then we'll look for our method code and other stuff at the end. So our service, when it starts up, is configured as a V0 or a V1 uh, service. The V1 implementation can handle both. As I just said, we fall back if it doesn't look like a V1 style message. We'll detect which version it is. We'll use the right uh, decoder to pull the right uh, uh, bytes out of the buffer. Um, our clients then are either V0 or V1 clients. At this point, everything's V1, but uh, as we migrated, that wasn't the case. And so the client just writes however he wants to write. If he's a V1 client, he's going to write all the trace stuff. If he's a V0 client, he's not. And then we made this decision that on the response, everything was going to be V0 so that clients never had to worry about things when they came back. Everybody could parse that message coming back. So an old client speaks the old version. The server responds with the old version. He can still handle it. A new client speaks the new version. The server responds with the old version, so he can still handle it. Um, so this let us do backwards compatibility, and uh, we didn't have to update clients until the clients were ready to say, you know, I need for some reason to rev to newer stuff. Let me pick up the V1 stuff while I do that. So these are the kinds of things that you have to deal with when you're writing and maintaining a protocol. And think about how do I add stuff to, um, to a protocol that I've already got running? How do I deal with backwards compatibility in the middle of that? So error handling and mapping. So we chose to do uh, our error handling at application level. So we pass, as I showed you before, um, when I showed you the response message, we have an error field within our response message and we populate that error field when we have errors. So our service dispatcher catches any exceptions that happen, uh, turns those into error messages and sends them back out. And our error messages have, a, uh, have an error code that tells us in this case, we're not, we're not doing that very sophisticatedly, but there's five or six errors that we handle, and so each one is assigned a, a number. Um, and then the message is uh, all the text that we're pulling from the exception itself. So um, both the, the error message and all of the uh, stack trace information that we have on the server side. On our service side, we have uh, an exception handler which goes from exception to message, so it catches, it the service dispatcher catches the exception, the handler converts that exception to a message, uh, and then that's what gets returned in the response. Then on the client side, when you get that back, you go the other way. Uh, so you take that, um, that error, you, you take the whole response message, you decide if it has an error field in it or not. If it has an error field in it, you send that error to the handler. The handler turns it back into an exception. And then we usually throw it, which I don't like. <laughs> so 
some of the lessons and recommendations that we have as we went through that. So why might you build your own protocol um, through the lens of, of hindsight? Um, if you need to do one side support, like if you want, and HTTP is maybe not a good example, but uh, it's something that you would expect to see existing services that are not yours out speaking this kind of protocol, right? If you want to write the client side for some protocol to talk to some other server, or you want to write a server and have clients talk to you, that might be a good reason to write your own protocol. If you need to interop with some kind of legacy uh, service that you have that speaks some kind of other wire format that does come some kind of weird, that might be a good reason uh, to build your own protocol. And there's a couple of good examples in Finagle Core about wrapping other things into services. So something like MySQL or Redis lookups end up looking like Finagle services. Uh, that might be a good reason to write your own protocol. Otherwise, you're probably better off using one of the existing protocols. It's a lot of work to write and maintain your own protocol. So uh, if you don't have one of these compelling reasons, using existing ones is probably your way to go. Error handling. Uh, it's tricky to get right. It's even worse to test. Um, it, with, with hindsight, um, we think we probably would have preferred to do uh, transport or in protocol level handling. Um, the Finagle Thrift uses protocol level. As I mentioned, they have an exception type in Thrift, uh, so that's fantastic. Um, otherwise, doing it on the wire uh, is probably a lot easier than forcing your engineers to include an, uh, an error field in their message, because now what happens if they don't? So now I've got to have code in my protocol to deal with does the user have, does the message have an error field in it, and if so, use it. If not, figure out what a fallback is, blah, blah, blah. Right, if I'm doing everything on the wire, don't have to worry about that. So support, community is pretty solidly thrift and HTTP, and Twitter's pretty much focusing a lot of their, uh, their efforts into MUX. So if you can use these, uh, you get a lot of their enhancements, a lot of their bug fixes for free. Um, there's other people in the community working on them, et cetera. If you go your own way, you're going your own way, right? And that means you're going to have to keep it maintained. That means when um, they come up with a new clever way to do uh, retries, you're going to have to figure out how to backport that into your protocol, so on. So again, if you uh, don't have one of those compelling reasons, using theirs is a pretty good way. Uh, when you're figuring out what to expose in your interface, do I use the Finagle interface? Do I use a generated interface that I got out of Proto-C or a Thrift compiler or something like that? Uh, do I use an existing generator like Proto-C and deal with all the weirdness of the interface shapes that it gives me? Or do I roll my own like Twitter did with Scrooge to have uh, code emitted that fits to a shape that's nicer for them to work with, fits more nicely with Finagle? You have to decide what you're going to expose to your, to your developers and what you're going to hide away. So we made the, uh, the decision that a lot of this stuff gets hidden behind another wrapper library. So our developers, remember I already said Guava listenable futures, not Scala or Twitter futures. Um, a lot of our developers are using Java on top of this, not Scala on top of this. So we tried to wrap this stuff and hide it away. And that's caused a lot of pain for us over time. Um, you know, we thought that that would give us um, some decoupling so that we could rip Finagle out, but it's a leaky abstraction. Lots and lots of things are going to have to change fundamentally for us if we move away from Finagle. So now I'm paying all this complexity cost for something that's really not going to buy me what I think it's going to buy me. We bring in new engineers. They're going to have to learn how our stack works anyway. Why is that any easier than teaching them how Finagle works? So facade approaches, they're very tricky, right? You've got leaky abstractions or figuring out how to map those abstractions together. You have to decide what you're hand rolling, what you're generating. The more layers and the more magic you have, the fewer engineers on your team who are going to understand that and be able to really dig into that and get to the root of everything. So, um, 
with hindsight, our recommendation is probably expose the finagle stuff and fewer layers and more simplicity. So um, as you build a protocol, right, you might have things that are based on an interface. Uh, some of that's going to be interfaces that are generated by your, uh, your generators. Some of that are going to be things that you do yourself, like the exception handler interface. And now you have to decide, if I'm writing to an exception handler interface, where am I supplying the implementation for that? Am I supplying it in, as an example uh, in docs, as a default, as uh, in a wrapper library? Am I forcing uh, my developers to write the exception handler? Uh, there's all reasons that you might do any of those, but uh, I would definitely push uh, towards be sure that you at least have an example implementation for any of the uh, interfaces that you write in your protocol um, and, and have good docs around that, right? Because if your engineers want to try to dig into this and they can't even figure out where's the implementation for that exception handler interface, how do I get a service up and running and just figure, learn anything more about this? So that leads into making things easy for your developers. You want to have good docs, you want to have good examples, uh, real code as well as uh, documentation code, right? Um, test beds. So we've done a lot of work very recently to try to understand various configuration parameters and how they interact with one another and what are the causes of certain kinds of errors and how do we respond from those kinds of errors. Um, and having a simple test bed that's not a full running uh, production uh, service has been really useful for us to have a small place where we can just iterate on tests. Uh, and seed projects. You want to allow your developers to start from something and not just go read the docs and figure out how to build a new service. And, uh, as you build more complicated services on top of things, having those seed projects be more and more like your real service, you know, your real build files, your real Docker builds, your um, other tools and frameworks that you might be interacting with in most of your services, things like those, um, so that people aren't bootstrapping themselves up from nothing, um, where nothing may mean literally like no good docs, nothing. So I mentioned about us just recently doing a lot more of this learning. This has been an ongoing process for us. We're three years into running Finagle-based stuff in production, and we're still doing experiments and things all the time to understand how do different uh, configurations affect my, my behavior, my performance, what might cause certain kinds of errors, how do I recover from those kinds of errors. Um, for example, the interaction between max concurrent requests on the server, uh, wait queue depths on the client, timeouts throughout things. Um, all these things interact with one another, right? And so we're continuing to learn that kind of stuff. Um, and when you're building a protocol, that's important because A, you want to make your protocol fit to the framework in the most efficient way possible. But B, you want to be able to diagnose this and understand what behaviors are coming from the, the underlying framework and what problems are arising because of things in your protocol, right? If I'm doing something weird with a couple of extra exception uh, catchers and I've got three extra futures that are hidden inside of there, right, there may be some of that behaviors arising from me, not just because of something that came from Finagle. So a uh, couple of things to check out. Um, first of all, uh, uh, Mr. Nadav Samet, I hope I didn't just massacre his name, is speaking tomorrow morning about Spark and protocol buffers. I'm excited to hear his talk tomorrow. And uh, uh, part of his talk, I think he's talking about an alternative to Proto-C. Uh, so we're interested in looking into that. Uh, Finagle Serial is a Finagle protocol uh, in, um, in the Finagle organization uh, that uses Skodek underneath so you can build a binary format uh, services. Uh, and this is where you can find Finagle Protobuf. All the things I showed you here are, uh, we're hoping to have land uh, in PR there in the next couple of weeks. So I think I've got five more minutes. <laughs>
if anyone has any questions. So the, the question is, are we publishing our learnings? Um, yes, I think we absolutely should. I don't know what the shape of that is. Um, we do not have a, an engineering specific blog, so I'm not sure how that will be, but that's a fantastic suggestion. I definitely like to do that. Any other questions? So the question was, when we revved our protocol, why did the service not respond in kind? So what you're suggesting is the service receives a V1 message and returns a V1 response. The server receives a V0 message, returns a V0 response. That's a really good question. Um, honestly, I think we just did not really think through that way of solving the problem. Because uh, I spoke to one of the engineers and asked him that question the other day. And he's like, yeah, that would have been a great idea. Did we consider compressing our protobuf uh, message? We have not. Uh, for our uh, scale and, and size of messages, uh, we've found that just the density of the binary format over JSON has been enough reduction in message size uh, that we've been happy with that. Um, anything else? One more. Um, what was the reasoning for uh, using a envelope for your response and the request? So I think the biggest reason for that was around having a place to put the error. Um, so something I didn't really touch on too much uh, in, the, in the body of the talk is you have to let as you go through this kind of process, right, it's better to iterate on this and let the process teach you what the shape should be. If you start uh, by constraining yourself and saying, I want my messages to look like this because I have a pre -no uh, preconceived notion of how to deal with that kind of message, uh, you're probably jumping through some extra hoops to make the protocol fit that constraint. If you feel it out as you go, you might make different decisions. Uh, and I think in this case, we had sort of decided ahead of time that we wanted to have the errors uh, kept separate from, um, from the responses and done at kind of that package level. So we can pass around that envelope and always have the error there and always have the success case there. Uh, did you consider even looking at using Monkstall while you're doing this? So we absolutely have. Um, we built Finagle Protobuf uh, back in late 2012, early 2013. Uh, we spent a lot of time in a lot of conversations in 14 as MUX was being built. Um, we've still got a lot of ongoing discussion internally about do we want to build on top of MUX or do we want to just migrate from Finagle Protobuf to Thrift entirely, Thrift MUX entirely. So that's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, in practice, right, we built this before MUX and we've been sticking with what we had. So I think that's about all the time I have and it's lunch, so um, I'd like to let you guys go a minute early. Thank you very much.